Hi, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to this week's edition of Life in the Law. I am delighted this week to have Ellen Godby Carson with me. Uh, we met through Hawaii Women Lawyers. Mm -hmm. She's a former president of that organization, also a partner in Alston Hunt and Ng. And we'd like to talk today about uh, a little bit about the past, about where we've come from as women in the law, and where we'd like to go in the the kinds of secret things they don't teach you in law school. So I, I, I think we can, we both agree that there are definitely, there's definitely things one needs to learn while one's on the job in order to maximize the one's career. So welcome, Ellen. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for having me on the show. Okay. okay great. Um, so let's, talk, were you at the inception of HWL? Were you actually I wasn't. There? Okay. No, I believe it was formed in 1976. Okay. By a small group of attorneys then, okay. and I didn't come to the islands until 1979. Oh, okay. So it's, but it was a fledgling organization yes. when you joined. Mm -hmm. And has it grown substantially since the early days? It has. It's become much more formal, and it has many more members, much more active, so yes. I love this new CLE program that you're, um, we're, that the HWL is giving, where you can have CLE credits during lunch. I think that's a terrific idea. Uh, that certainly encourages a lot better attendance. It does, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> As attorneys, we're all required to have at least three hours of continuing legal education every year. And so now, for the first year, we're offering our Lunch and Learn program as something where people can get continuing legal education credits for many of the programs, and that's great. I've been to as many as I lunches that I've been able to make, and I've learned something at every single one. I think I just think they're just terrific. I still remember very particularly the uh, in-house counsel one was really very illuminating for me. It was. It, I, I urge everyone to try to make time. Everybody has a very busy day, but try to make time in your day for the Hawaii Women Lawyers Ladies Lunch series. It is just just terrific, and you, you meet your people. You meet, yeah. you meet your network. You meet you know these people I want to be like, people I want to help, people I want to work with. I mean, this is, you know, this is how we do it. Yeah. Many of them have become lifelong friends to me. It feels like a friendship circle of sisters. And, it is. And we gather, and I think we're real good at supporting each other, finding better ways to practice law, finding better ways to deal with opponents, <laughs> and yeah. to deal with a structure that's still largely male, still largely formalized in a way that was developed initially by men in a way that women don't always feel like they're comfortable and at home there. So there's a lot of challenges still to practicing when one's female. Well, we have a common interest, which is uh, alternative dispute resolution. And when I think about the law being largely male, I think of the adversarial system. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, how, how wonderful it must have been when y you could have settled a dispute as a knight on a horse and just knocked the other. That must have been <laughs> the heyday of men in the law. They couldn't, couldn't, have, couldn't have been better, so, you know. It's cheaper and faster, <laughs> but, but the result's pretty hard on one person, so we often yeah, look for Yeah, we developed something. A little, something a little bit m more uh, mindful, I suppose. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, would you like to tell us a little bit about your practice? I know you practice um, healthcare law, but, you, uh, but I know also that you're going into other fields, the, the fields that you love, yeah, civil rights. Yeah. Well, I, I began as a civil rights attorney. That's why I initially went to law school and came out of Harvard Law School excited about doing civil rights and started with the U.S. government right as Ronald Reagan got elected, and he was not a fan of civil rights. No, he so, was not. Um, yeah, I still had a job and a salary, but very little civil rights work to be done. So I found another um, firm at that point, and it was to do a class action suit for Japanese-American redress that went up to the U.S. Supreme Court twice, and that took about seven years of effort working with the Japanese American community. And if, if uh, that's, that's a matter that I have the most sense of accomplishment and, and just joy that I was able to assist. That's fascinating. Yeah. But it, it, even there, so there was a still Japanese American redress uh, case in the 70s. That's how long it went on. on it, on, it was on, in the 80s. It was it, 40 years afterwards. Right, oh. right. And ultimately, the statute of limitations was what the Supreme Court decided was something that would not permit it to move forward, which was sad. But there was monetary redress from Congress and right. other, other things. And when that suit was through, I moved out to Hawaii with my husband and began with Alston Hunt, Floyd, and Ng. And it was a mixture of different work. As many young attorneys, you, you take on whatever work right. that other attorneys need you to do and whatever clients need to be served in the, the field that I developed uh, as a full-time area of practice was healthcare law. And most recently, that's involved being very up-to-date on Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act, which right. are actually one and the same. 
and doing work for providers and hospitals and insurers and that whole industry that's an exciting, ever vibrant right. industry. Right. And then as well, I do some mediation and arbitrations, which is an alternative form of dispute resolution. So what types of mediations and arbitrations do you do? Do you do family-oriented ones or business-oriented I have not done family-oriented ones. It's almost always been business orientation. And since I've worked on both sides of civil rights issues, many times people feel comfortable bringing something to me that involves um, a dispute in a workplace, right. a dispute out in the community. I've also done things that are uh, contract or real estate oriented, so just a variety of things right. that way. Well, mm -hmm. I imagine there's there's plenty of uh, work workplace related disputes because Hawaii is such a casual place, and you know I just remember yeah. in New York this is huge. Tr you'd have to sit through an entire day of you know appropriate office conduct and what you may and <laughs> right. may not do. And <laughs> Hawaii, everybody's you know relaxed, kicked back. Nobody thinks much. I mean, people said some interesting things to me uh, along uh -huh. the way and I've been hmm, that's an interesting way to put it you know yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a funny little I uh, story uh, I was mentoring somebody and, and one of the partners said to me you're such a good mother you're, you're <laughs> such, you have such a motherly instinct I'm like that is mentoring okay that is what uh -huh. I am doing <laughs> uh -huh. let's call it that <laughs> exactly I think Hawaii's always talked a lot about race and on the mainland that's kind of a taboo subject right. and the fact that we're more open talking about race has its benefits and has right. its detriments as right. well but I think as a result sometimes we talk about other things that may be more off bounds on the mainland uh, and it can lead to trouble what's, sometimes. So what civil rights issues would you are you involved in or would you like to become more involved in? I mean, One of the ones that's been in my heart has been for the LGBT community and that's involved getting more respect and equality for LGBT community, uh, getting equal marriage rights and I particularly like to work with the faith community because I've always been very active in church and I'm active at the Church of the Crossroads and the United Church of Christ. And one of the things they provided nationally in the denomination was training on biblical self-defense, which oh, means essentially great. getting the passages of the Bible that many conservatives use to really, really target gay and lesbians and, and hit them over the head with these Bible passages that are called the clobber passages. And we go into critical analysis of those passages and what they were originally meant and how, how much more open interpretation can occur that actually leaves a much more positive, respectful interpretation of those passages. That's fascinating. For people of faith, I think it's very important to be mm -hmm. able to reconcile those passages with a feeling that we do want respect for everybody. Now, right. how, you said that you, you attended a seminar nationally? or Right. You, Our denomination provided a seminar. I have, yeah. a great, I have yeah. another thing for you to do. You're, if your church offered a course like that or a, a little a seminar like that, I would, I would be there in a heartbeat. I'd well, I'll do it again then. I've done it maybe half a dozen times oh. in this community. But that oh. was the purpose, is so that we become trained in doing biblical self-defense discussions and workshops with churches. I would churches. love that, because and, I'm involved yeah. in the LGBT yeah. community, too. And, uh, you know, I told you, coming from New York, it was a big change for me because there isn't quite the um, interaction between uh, uh, the LGBT com community and, and the heterosexual community. I should say cisgender, I suppose. I could, I mm -hmm. could say straight, but whatever. So, um, and, uh, you know, I've been showing up at these events, and uh -huh. people are like, why are you here? I'm, uh -huh. I am here? I'm here in support. That's why I'm here. I'm here because that's Good. what we do, you know. And... Uh, but I'd like to see a lot more inter interaction and, and alliances along along what are essentially, you know, similar paths. You know, I mean, right. definitely there are people that have similar paths. You know, women and uh, women and gays have similar paths, similar mm -hmm. roads to hoe, and with respect to being who you are and mm -hmm. not having to fit a certain mold and right. You know, and it helps so much. I think when those of us who are straight. Uh, who are in the Christian community simply speak out and say we support this. This is at our very core of definition of self and this community deserves the same equality, respect, dignity and, and family life as anybody right. else in this community. And They deserve to be in leadership, they deserve to be to, to have the type of respect we would want for everybody. So uh, just as with the women's movement, it really helps when men come forward and say it is not acceptable to have violence against women. It's not acceptable to have different wage rates for women. Right. Uh, it's very helpful for those of us who are straight or are Christian to help speak out within those communities. Well, that's, that's part how of what we're supposed to do. Yeah, that's how that's part of the damage is done, right. is just right. remaining silent. Right, right, right. exactly. Tacit uh, assent. Right. Yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. I remember now, I just realized that we, we were both were at the uh, 
LGBT uh, parade last year. I was just talking oh, yes. to the, the someone about parade. this year's yeah. and this year's parade, and yeah. and uh, uh, they, there was a, I guess a long history of there were two groups that had the yes. parade. They finally merged. <laughs> Thank and, goodness. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. So I thought that was kind of interesting. It was a little interesting uh, little t tidbit. Of yeah, that. yeah. And we're working on the churches. It started out I think Crossroads and maybe one other church were in the gay pride parade over the past 10 years. And just the past two or three years, we've seen more and more faith communities joining in and saying, that's yes, great. this is where our heart is too. And we stand in support of this community. That's and great. that's great. That's, that's great, great because, be. yeah, I right. agree, I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, I, t I told you I'm involved with the uh, Hawaii, uh, the gay men's choir, chorus, mm -hmm. and it, it just, it's just a delight. It's a delight to, to, to yeah, socialize with them and, and just, have a gr you know great time march with them yeah. I, 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 they're just a just a really fun group so uh, somebody uh approached me today from the L lgp lgbt endowment foundation oh. Are you I, no, not. I just said today they, they said uh could we i saw your picture in in one of the gay men's course pictures and it was a client of mine. Uh -huh. My client called me up and said, so are you, do you do these things? And I said, uh -huh. yeah, I, yeah, I do these things. This uh -huh. is what I do. So he said, oh, well, can you help us? I'm like, sure, no problem, definitely. It was, it was nice. funny, you know, it was just a funny little, yeah. you know. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, I want to talk, obviously, about how you became so successful and uh, what what you think both firms can do and what we as individuals can do to empower ourselves to, to, to you know, gain the partnerships and, you know, directorships and seats, mm -hmm. seats at the table. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I sort of wanted to say that I, because that's a very, I guess we can start that, right, talking about it, right? Oh, we, yeah, I, I think maybe we could say that the next segment we can really get involved in it. So I think we'll just take a brief break right now, and then we'll get back to Ellen Godby Carson and find the secret of what? Success and happiness as a, <laughs> oh, as yeah, a, right, a right. lawyer <laughs> in Hawaii? <laughs> okay. Aloha. My name is Richard Emery, and I host Condo Insider. We talk about issues facing the Condo Association throughout Hawaii and talk about solutions. When you think about it, about one-third of our population lives in some form of common interest real estate. We broadcast every Thursday at 3 p.m. Please tune in. Tune in and thank you. Aloha. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech. This show is so very dear to my heart. We talk with artists of various different ilk here about the process that they go through for their art. So we talk about what they're doing, why they are doing it, how they do it. And it's a show that is inspiring. This is what I hear from people all the time. And a show that will teach you something, sometimes something about yourself. I hope you'll join us. The show is Center Stage. It's on Think Tech every Wednesday at 2 o'clock. We'll see you then. Welcome back to Life in the Law. Today I have Ellen Godby Carson, uh, a, attorney, friend, activist. <laughs> at, yes, I say, I'd say. And one of the things we love to talk about, and we, we can talk about this endlessly, is how a woman navigates a law firm. Because frankly, law firms are still often, maybe not Alston Hunt, but m mostly, our uh, old boy networks, and we have mm -hmm. to find our ways. And so, I guess, how did you find your way initially? I found my way by doing what I loved the most, trying to gravitate toward the type of work I enjoyed, the type of people I enjoyed being with, and trying to develop my own line of business, because I knew part of the secret of being able to try to have a sense of having more control over practice is having clients that came to me that I was responsible for, so I could help develop a schedule that would work. I could be able to hire staff that would be able to assist that were That's the type key. of people that I wanted to be with. Uh, and so I could do the work in a style that was consistent with my values and have things that I loved in my heart. So that really helps. And that really requires rainmaking because it's very difficult for women to get ahead or anybody to get ahead in law uh, in the private sector without being able to bring in clients and help support the economic foundation of a firm and unfortunately it's an area where a lot of women in particular 
if you're shy. No, Why, yeah, they shy away from yeah, that. Why is that? I, 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 you know, it's funny. I have had two mentees, and both of them wanted jobs at the firm, and I said they were interns. And I said to them, you know, go in and ask, ask for it. Ask, mm -hmm. tell them you want it. Right, uh, right. You know, they it, it, they never contemplated. Asking, you have to ask for business. You have to seek right. people's business. They have to know you actively want it, right? right. And I right. think that's hard for women to ask a it direct is. question like that, right? It is, because it makes us feel like we have to be out there putting ourselves forward and touting ourselves and drawing attention to ourselves in order to try to market and to sell. And for most of us, we're taught exactly the opposite. The culture right. for women says, don't bring attention to yourself, don't bring attention to successes just go along and try to serve others and that we should focus on serving others instead of being successful ourselves. And most of us kind of specialize in being of service to I, others. And it's a pitfall for a lawyer. It's a yeah. real pitfall for a lawyer because, you know, you can be the very, very best at a subject, uh, at a practice area, and um, you'll just see people climbing right by you mm -hmm. and they will mm -hmm. utilize your services everyone will be and mm -hmm. they'll speak very highly of you but you just won't get the level of control it's all about right. how much you can control your environment right yeah. how much can I get it the way I like it so that I'm comfortable right. and, and uh, women had you know we, we spoke about this earlier where women have a tendency to think well if I'm very 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 good I'm gonna get rewarded and it doesn't Maybe in school it works like that, maybe. It doesn't, it doesn't work that work. way in the law. No. We call it the Cinderella syndrome. Just sitting back in the dark little corner hoping if you just do 20 hours every day of wonderful work that somebody's going to discover you and thank you. But it's not nearly the same as getting out there in the public, being visible, helping bring new clients to the firm, and helping do those uh, projects successfully in a way that builds you up. And so we really need to encourage women to get into an area that I know is outside all of our comfort zones, but we really need to do it and just push on that and become better at attracting the type of work that we want to do right. and then having much more control over our lives. Right, that's, a, right. Right. that's another problem. I mean, I, I'm a corporate lawyer. I do transactional work. I'm the only woman mm -hmm. in the firm that does transactional work. There's definitely a tendency for women to go into regulatory work or you know, work mm -hmm. where there's a lot of work mm -hmm. and it, but it's not, you can't, you, you're not necessarily seen. Like if I, if, I, right. if I close a deal, I close a deal, it's my deal. Of course, mm -hmm. everybody knows it because I go around telling everybody. <laughs> Good. But, 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 but they need, women also need to put themselves in the position where they can be stars, where they can be noticed. Right. You know and what that's I mean? what a lot of times women shy back from that and we decide we'd rather do something that's not as risky, we want to be safe. Right. We'll wait until we're 100% qualified to right. take that next step. And men seem to be culturated so that they apply for things and push themselves forward when they may just have a part of the qualification. Oh, yeah, like 75%. Yeah. Like, good enough. Yeah. Oh, oh that's, they'd be lucky to have me. I have 75% of what they want. Yeah, and, totally and different like, attitude. <laughs> you know. Right. Uh, but I always say this, too. Um, I, 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 I know many young women, and uh, one of them... Uh, she's, she's just uh, accepted into officer's training school in Quantico, and uh, she's terrified. I said, mm -hmm. she said, you're never terrified. I said, I'm always terrified. Mm -hmm. I said, just to, you know, be terrified, then jump. That's my <laughs> philosophy. Be terrified, nothing wrong with it. It's only yep. human, but jump anyway. You have to. Sometimes we say, fake it till you feel it. Right, exactly. Just put on that sense of being confident, knowing what you're doing, being in control of things, even though inside we feel very differently. I think particularly in law, our clients need to see that level of confidence. The, absolutely. And it's very persuasive when you see someone who's has a lack of confidence, isn't sure what they're saying or what they really think versus someone that's very firm and, and knowledgeable and puts themselves out there. It's very different. The worst is when you're on the other side of somebody like that and you just want to shake them to get yeah. the words out. Like, get it out. Say what you mean. What do you want here? Let's get going. Right, and sometimes there's confidence in the lack with a lack of capability, and that's particularly frustrating when somebody's developed oh, that's their, very frustrating. their confidence side but doesn't have but the content But women don't there. do that. I, I mean, I, that's <laughs> terrible. It, it sounds like a sexist thing to say, but I have to say that women, I, 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 I can't even think of any women I've ever known that have been overly confident with an under, uh, under amount of preparation. It's unusual. I, 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 you know. Because we're discouraged from being confident, right. and we're often punished when we're successful, and the first female along the way, whether it's in politics as Hillary Clinton now is or somewhere else, is, is going to have a lot of pushback on being a successful woman. And right. we all need to help counter that. Right. right. Well, you know, I think, you know, I'm, 
I'm not, uh, she's not my candidate, but I must say, she is awfully presidential these days. I mm -hmm. look at her and her presentation and her, her um, she's just, I, I can see her being president. It's like, it's almost like she's, ste she's stepping into these shoes. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen. And, uh, but, but uh, she's, She's definitely a force to be reckoned with. I don't think anybody, even whether she's your candidate or not, would would say that she's not overly qualified for the job. She certainly yeah. is. She's got it. You know, she's more than any man that's running. I mean, right. she's got more experience. So, you know. it, it is interesting to look at women who have become very successful and look at public impressions of women's success. And often the public acts very differently toward a woman who is successful, who is strong, who has capabilities that are at a very high level and reacts negatively to that. I agree. And that's very frustrating because it's a lot of pushback against women as they're trying to develop their skills, just as people that are in minority populations have the same issue. People I agree. aren't used to them being successful. I agree. Right? You know, I, it's funny, I, uh, especially particularly when I started out in New York, I, I, used, I used to use this, this metaphor of Scylla and Charybdis who are these Greek mythological figures, and you'd had to navigate. To, one was on one shore, one was on the other shore, and you had to navigate mm -hmm, through that right. shore. So, um, with being a woman, a professional woman, there's almost no way you can be. If you're aggressive and assertive and sort of act like a guy, you know, or you know, mm -hmm. hale and hearty, whatever, people think, oh, well, she's very aggressive. She's very pushy. If you're a little bit more detached, as some and some men you use that method, um, you're not. Uh, you don't take enough initiative, so there's. It's almost. It's like threading a needle. You have to. Right. There's, there's. There's almost no way you can be. And so, as a consequence of that, I felt well. I'm going to choose a course, and mm -hmm. I'm going to choose mm -hmm. a course that I that I can do that I'm comfortable with because, obviously, this is untried territory. You know. I mean. Right. This, well, you know, and and that's part of what we're trying to do with the, uh, HWF. Well, uh, why women lawyers? HWL. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to to try to, to beat the path so that it, it's a little easier for every generation. It certainly helps to have a broad range of role models so that people see different styles uh, and to have authenticity so that people can be who they are. But as, with authenticity, I think, needs to come that concept of leaning in that Sheryl Sandberg's so good about explaining because when so much of our culture constantly wants us to be subservient and to service and not bringing attention to ourselves, it really brings down the total talent that women otherwise could be able to share. And so I think we need to get more used to going into um, areas where we are not comfortable and simply leaning in and saying, yes, I can do that, and raising the hand and getting at the table right. and doing those types of things. And speaking Taking the out, job. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, it, I, I've been at countless meetings that have been equal men and women, and, and the women just, the men will throw out any you know idea <laughs> that, you know, and, and women are, just silent, and I'm thinking, come on, you know, you guys, I right. can't only, you know. Right. So, so it is. Right. So, how? What would you recommend? Um, how if I? Well, I do want. This is what I do want. This this advice. So, if I wanted to generate uh, business, mm -hmm. what what kinds of things would would be? I mean, I've joined some clubs. I've joined the country mm -hmm. club, which mm -hmm. I think is very useful. But what kinds of things would you say that you know, younger women, to mm -hmm. particularly? Because you know you can't start thinking about this too soon. You, fresh out of law school, this is yes, you that's be the time to be doing this. it. Yeah, fresh in law school. Every just keep week, every contact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every week, every month, and every year. And I think one thing is just to look around and find people that impress you. And when they impress you, go meet them, find out what's going on, offer to have coffee or something with them, and be able to get some energy from that. Understand the community as a result of the skills that they have, right. and share something that can be able to benefit them. Right. I think that's one thing. Right. Uh, okay. Networking is another thing, like being in Hawaii Women Lawyers or any other professional group or on a board. Uh, I think uh, particularly board service enables us to be operating at a high policy level, learning a lot of business skills, but contributing in a way that really shares our legal talents, our management talents, develops uh, intimate knowledge of the type of things that that clients needs and at the same time we're meeting everybody else on that board right. and we're helping being visible right. in regards to community things so and they welcome the, they they welcome the help i mean so many boards are going wanting for board members mm -hmm. i mean they, they, it's 
it's hard to get people who are willing to serve, but it's... Uh, it, that's amazing to me, because, yeah, there's so much opportunity for service there, but I just always encourage people, if you're going to do board service or do a leadership opportunity, don't just do it to get it on your resume. Do it because it's in your heart. Do it to the best of your capability. Do it in a manner that you want to be president of that organization and that you start contributing in a way that'll have vision and help move that organization forward. Well, you know, yeah. it develops you as a person. If you don't do it with authenticity, if you don't genuinely do something, then you don't get the development that comes along with doing You're it. Right. It's not like you can hand somebody your resume, apply on your resume and say, look, I, this is why I'm really good, but you, they uh -huh. have to be able to see it. They have to be able to see, to know that you've participated. You understand the mechanics of whatever, spreadsheets, right. profits and losses, whatever right. whatever the, the, the board is dealing with. But yeah, I, well, I think everybody should always engage with authenticity. If it's yeah. not worth it, life is too short. Not well, it to, is. Right? And in Hawaii, we're so relationship-based, too, that I'm constantly encouraging folks that I mentor to go out and develop relationships with other people that'll be lifelong relationships that are with people that you really respect and, and want to, to help gain some knowledge from. And it's that level of personal relationship that often results in the trust of being able to call to problem solve together, of being able to help when there's, when there's business available. And that's, that's a great benefit. It's fun, but then it often ends up with a business. Right. As well. right, right. It, it's surprising how that happens. It's a little. It's like a little feat of magic. You don't really. You're doing a favor for somebody, or you're just like them, and you you want to, them in your social circle. And then all of a sudden, oops, they need a lawyer. You know, oops. Right. Um, um, I, I'm thinking of starting a little company, or my yeah. friend is, or uh, you're a lawyer, aren't you? Well, can I have so and so call? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. That, that's that's you know. Yeah. Great when that happens. To Steve. mention just a couple of pet peeves, it's, it's common in our field, as you know, that we're solicited to purchase a table at a fundraiser mm -hmm. or an event and to take a whole firm, mm -hmm. you know, 10 people to fill that table or to go to a mixer cocktail that's business oriented. And it's so common at that type of thing that the firm will all sit together at their own table, right. not really mix with other people, or you go to the mixer and you find people you already know and you, you reacquaint yourself, but it's not the same as thinking, you know, probably in this group there's going to be five, ten people that I would love to get to know, that I would love to know what they think about thus and so, or what their future sense of is of where we should be in Hawaii, things like that. And then try to find those people and try to think of it as almost unwrapping a gift or something. If these people are somebody that I can explore and get to know, and each one of them is a special person that can be part of my future. Well, you know, we bought a, a table at the Hawaii Women's mm -hmm. uh, Law uh, Awards Dinner. Hawaii Women's Lawyers Awards Dinner, and um, awards dinner, and I'm going to give that speech to my little cadre uh, the, oh, yeah. the, the, uh, that, that that's coming along with me, and I'm going to tell them to go out there and that we shouldn't be. I didn't even I hadn't even think of that. Mix and match. Go yeah. find somebody to trade with. Yeah, you know, because yeah, we, we have this yourself. table where where eight of us we're all at the same table, but we see each other all day. And that's right. a great idea. I never even you know it was like. I know, we lose the benefit of networking if we go to these places and just sit with the people we already know. So, yeah, that's a nice way to make better use. Or if, you're given, if you go to the trouble of doing a presentation for somebody or a workshop or a speech of some type, try to check in beforehand with some of the people that are going to be attending and see what their thoughts are and help include those thoughts. And afterwards, close the loop again with some of the people that were there and see what they thought and if they have additional angles that they can provide that will make you better for the future, right. but it also shows that you care about what right. they're doing and you want them to be successful. Well, so. I, w I like to put in a plug for the Hawaii Women Lawyers Awards Dinner, which is mm. April 22nd. Uh, it happens to be the first day of Passover, too, so if mm. you're celebrating Passover, we forgive your absence. But I, I urge everyone to buy a seat, buy a table if you can. Um, you should check the website. It's Hawaii Women Lawyers. Um, uh, do you know? Dot org. Dot org, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think we'll take a short break now, and uh, we'll see you in a moment. Okay, this is Think Tech Hawaii, and it's Wednesday. Every Wednesday is Energy Wednesday here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Come and listen to us. And just to show you what I mean, I'm going to ask Sharon to tell us more. Come and see us every Wednesday, as Jay said. And we have people like Jim Alvarez from HECO, 
here and co-host Ray Starling here every Wednesday. We not only go on Olelo and OC16, but also stream live. So please come visit us, hear about the latest in clean energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here. You got any comment on all this? As important as energy is in all of our lives today, this is a great forum and a great format to vet those issues. So I encourage everybody to listen in and participate. Okay, Ray, what do you think for a close? Well, I, I think this is the greatest show uh, in the energy world here in Hawaii. Uh, you can come here every week, one hour, and catch the latest on what's happening and hear from the people who really know what's going on. Uh, like Jim Alberts, we appreciate your coming today. Thank you. Ray Starling, Sharon Murray Waki, Jim Alberts, and Jay Fidel here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. 4 to 5 p.m. Wednesday. Aloha. Aloha. Hi, I'm Marianne Sasaki. I'm here with Ellen Godby Carson. We're discussing uh, women's. Uh, issues, women, issues that women lawyers face every day. And um, of course, I love to negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, ha so because everything is a negotiation, right? I mean, everything in life is, you know, I, I, I went to the Harvard Negotiation Project I attended. And uh, I use techniques I learned there, like nearly every day. I really oh, do. Great. Because every, if you want something, that's, that's how you get mm -hmm. it. That's mm -hmm. how you get it. You negotiate. You find your Pareto optimality. What's the point that you're both, you know, you're going to both get the best return? Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I think that maybe some of our colleagues don't like to negotiate so much. Women so. evidently do not negotiate for the, on their own behalf very frequently. Men often do, and we're seeing that that's part of the explanation for the wage gap that exists right now. It's often quoted as 79 cents or 80 cents. Uh, on the dollar, and that simply means that for for women, they're just making 79 or 80 cents for every dollar that a man makes. They're and like, thank you. Yeah. We, we're offering you X. They're, oh, that's plenty, thanks. And a man is like, X? No, I <laughs> right. was expecting X plus whatever. You know? Right, and men will negotiate, uh, even at entry-level positions. And, and outside beyond. the box, too. Women need to think what's important to them outside the box. Like, uh, for example, my uh, company, uh, gives parking spots I don't drive, mm -hmm. but that a uh, marketing budget is, uh, is what I mm -hmm. could use. You know, the, you, there are definitely perks that, that are, that you, mo that might be nothing for your company to give you. I mean, it might be right. costless, but f it might mean a lot to you. So it's important to right. think in a, you know, broad way uh, about, uh, about negotiating. But once again, you have to ask for it. You have to ask, you have to stand up and ask. Exactly. And it seems from the most recent studies that women are making less at every single level of, of work in the U.S. That is, entry-level positions, mid-management, upper management, uh, CEO levels, that women simply still are not making the level of pay that men are. And I, I think part of it has to do with this negotiation issue, and part of it has to do with some of the sexual bias that's still in the system. Well, there is entrenched sexual bias, and I think that nobody really believes it. I mean, I think p meeting some uh, people like us, and w where, it's, where we'll say w some women lawyers make 77% of what make w men make, and <laughs> they look at somebody like us and they say, oh, you're not, that couldn't possibly be you, but it's somebody. Mm -hmm. So I mean, these are the statistics. They're accurate, and I think people just don't want to believe, they just don't want to believe the statistics, because that means their sister or their friend or their daughter is getting shortchanged somewhere, you know, down mm -hmm. the line, and mm -hmm. it, it's 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 hard to you know grasp. It, you know, you, you you don't you don't want to think that that's an in, in, intent, but right. it is. Right. I've seen some studies that say one of the single best indicators in Congress for whether men are going to be supportive of women's issues is whether they have a daughter or yeah, not, because I'm sure they don't want to see her in a lower paid ranking. They don't want to see her without the same opportunities of a son. Right, and right. So that's very helpful, but we still need to, to have more consciousness. And, and some of this, some of the uh, recent movement has been for transparency of employment numbers, that is salaries in the private field, in order to be able to see whether or not there's disparity company by company and industry by industry. Well, um, I'm all for transparency in numbers. Mm -hmm. I, 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 uh, because you know, when I came here, I had no idea what the pay structure in law mm -hmm. firms was like, and I, I just, I, you know, took stab and I, I did a little research. But I, I think you should, if 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 you're, if you're proud to, if you have talent, 
mm -hmm. and you and you want to keep your talent, you should be proud of the compensation you pay your talent. I mean, it should be you know uh, a source of a pride for the for a company to want to publish that. If mm -hmm. you're trying to hide mm -hmm. that, I mean, there's, there's something wrong. There's a disconnect, and then, then you're not valuing your talent, as, you know, as mm -hmm. much as as you could be. So, you know. I, 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 I would do a personal survey and publish it. If, if maybe uh -huh, that's uh -huh. what I should do. I should just go from law firm to law firm and say, listen, can you give me some information? I well, can do a little some, secret you know, book. I think the HR representatives in, in most firms do informally communicate with one another to get a sense of where associates are paid, what of counsel are paid, what the partnership, equity, and non-equity positions that are. Must be true. That, that must be true. Well, it was my experience, because I had two offers at the same time. And yeah. They were right, 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 the neck and neck. <laughs> they read the same other. survey. Yeah, huh? exactly. <laughs> but it comes back around to rainmaking, because I think for women, when women want more pay, that to be able to bring business to the firm creates that portable book of business that can go somewhere else if the firm is not rewarding right that particular behavior and that is the lifeblood of firms is being able to have clients that are good clients to serve who need legal services and so the more women can balance their workload uh, to both include excellent service to the existing clients but an eye toward how can I help this firm be successful in the years to come by developing new clients that will bring the type of business we want. That's I have part to take of the key. a quick break. I'm sorry, to, I don't mean to cut you off. I have to take a quick break. Uh, you're watching Life in the Law. I'm Marianne Sasaki. Look forward to seeing you soon. Aloha. My name is Kirsten Baumgart Turner, and I'm the host of Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. We air live on the internet and also on Oceanic Channel 16. I would invite you to come for a fresh new show every Tuesday from 12 to 1 o'clock. I try to bring on guests that give us a different viewpoint on aspects of sustainability in Hawaii, as well as trying to unpack some of the difficult concepts of measuring and achieving sustainability, particularly with regard to sustainable economic growth and prosperity in Hawaii. Please join us every Tuesday from 12 to 1 p.m. Mahalo, aloha. Years old, but it might be exactly in sync with well, Welcome back to Life in the Law. I'm Marianne Sasaki. I'm here today with Ellen Gabby Carson, and we're talking about a subject that lawyers love to discuss ad nauseum, which is their <laughs> compensation, and how to maximize their compensation. So, uh, yeah, I think if you, have, if you have business, I mean, that's the first thing that, if you do attempt to negotiate, that's the first thing they're going to point to and say, well, if you have business, we can talk. Mm -hmm, and, if, mm -hmm. and if you don't, it, you're much more under the thumb of management. And I think that male lawyers, even coming in, there's the assumption that they're going to bring clients in, you know, mm -hmm. their buddies maybe that they play golf with or some guys from some teams that they were on or the fraternity <laughs> brothers yeah. or whatever. So um, that, that is the key. That is the key to a successful, uh, if there is one key, mm -hmm. right, to a life as a successful lawyer in, in the private sector, it's clients. That's, that's it's the first and the last word, I think, right? <laughs> I mean, it is. Clients and keeping them happy. And keeping them happy, absolutely. But in some ways, it may be like a real estate broker or a salesperson that needs to be able to have clients that support the product or service line that they're doing, or else obviously there's not a job there. We them. have the unfortunate position, though, often of telling clients something that they don't want to hear. And so, you know, no, you can't do that. Why? Well, it's against several securities laws <laughs> and uh, frowned upon by. So it's, it's not in such, in such an easy task keeping uh, the clients happy all mm -hmm, the time, mm -hmm. especially, you know, uh, well, I think if you litigate, then if you, I had a friend, a good friend that was litigated, she was like, if you win, it's, oh, of course I won. And if you don't win, it's, why didn't you win? So, you know, yeah. it's a, that kind of thing where, you know, mm -hmm. clients are very demanding and, Litigation is very demanding, and I hope anybody that's involved or thinking of litigation will consider alternatives to litigation, like mediation in particular. Cause I it's think so. I think so much better. It's so much better, and you know, it saves so much money, yeah. and everybody's happier with the outcome. I mean, you know, it's funny. I asked you whether you did family law uh, mediation, but you know, business law, especially small business law, mm -hmm. you know, 
it's like a family. It's like a family. You know what I mean? It's personal. It's and not. So it's is not it, certain so types of employment are the same, or a condominium association. It becomes like family. Almost. Yeah, we're not rational economic actors. Right. Not you know, right. not necessarily. And, and 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 when you have to sit down at the table, it's a lot different than sitting at opposite tables with your counsel arguing in front of a judge. If you sit down at a table and you mediate an issue, you're it's it's intimate. Right. Right, and you're personally invested, and you know what your alternative is to that, um, to a peaceful resolution. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and that's just critical. So I, I wish we would. Your best you're alternative bad enough, right, to the negotiated, to negotiated settlement is, is yeah. what you constantly compare your settlement offer with. Because if you have something that's better than what you would face if you don't accept that, then it's a good settlement. Yeah. Right. I think the courtroom also just escalates people's d d desires. It, it, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, encourage settlement, despite the fact that the judge might right. be saying settle, settle, settle. It's just it's it's a very, it's a it's an arena of conflict, and mm -hmm. people uh, want to go at it, you know, hammer and tongs when they're in there, you know. It's so. part of the adversarial system. Right. The attorney keeps touting the strengths of the case to the court, right. and often the clients hear the strengths but don't as much appreciate what the weaknesses are that the attorney is not necessarily focusing on. So yeah. do you think mediation can be used in virtually every, every area of I the do. law? I do. I think virtually everywhere it can be used and can be used successfully. And it's impressive what has happened in the state in regards to use of mediation. Because there's some areas where you just think it wouldn't work. Like small claims court, people come in and they're given less than an hour to talk to a mediator. And if they don't settle, they go to the court. But 50% or so of those are able to settle. They, they have mediation even once you're through, all the way through trial and then up at the Court of Appeals. And you'd think, heck, those folks have already been through five or seven years. They're not going to be willing to settle. And almost half of those settle. It's amazing how so often, it's amazing. right? How, right. I, I know. You, and it, it, you can, it evolves over the course of, a, of the time, too. That You yeah. have to go through almost like the five stages of grief. You know, yeah, you do. Anger, <laughs> bargaining. You, know, right. the, you see people evolve toward then um, acceptance toward the, right. at the end. You know, right. They're like, all right, this is really for the best. And do I ha and how how long do I want to do this? Right. Let's face it. How long do I want? Life is too short. Sometimes. Yeah, it really life is. is too short to be high stressed, focusing on something that's bad that happened in the past, uh, committing resources to that that just go on and on, and then finally subjecting yourself to a third party, the judge, that you have no ultimate control over. So the whole system <laughs> is not necessarily no, anything litigation. that we would draw as an ideal way to figure things out. Well, you know, I don't know if I've ever told you, but. Um, you know, when I was in law school, you know, we had to make the choice coming out of law school whether we would do transactional law litigation. And I said to myself, okay, I'm pushy. I'm loud. I talk too much. Do I really want to become a litigator? Do I really want to exacerbate all these qualities that I'm trying to control? No, I do not. I do not want, I do not want to be rewarded uh -huh. for these qualities. And, and, th and that's why I didn't go into litigation because really, you're, yeah. it's, you're always... You're always in that mode, or yeah. when you're at least when you're in trial, you're in that right. mode, you right. know. And yeah. all the all the juices, all the tension, all the yeah. it's constantly flowing. It's yeah, and it's hard. It, it's an emotional roller coaster because you're so much committed to it, right. just 24 hours a day for as many weeks, months, or years as it takes. As my husband sometimes says that we get paid as lawyers to to worry about problems even more than the client does. And no, that's I think right. That's if true. they can offload right. their worry, that's yes. well worth the cost. Yeah. It's yeah. well worth the cost. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, thank you. It was, it was a pleasure. Wonderful, wonderful talking to you about subjects that I just love talking about. Um, we, next week we have a very interesting guest. Uh, we have a young woman who has been accepted to officers training school in Quantico. And uh, she's going to tell us about the rigorous training they undergo, which would probably be useful to becoming a lawyer as well. Uh, so thank you so much for appearing on Think Tech, Ellen. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Marianne Sasaki.